Hello, everyone. I'm Sasha Gibali, SVP of Strategy at the Thai. And today I'm excited to be joined by David Kramer, um, COO, and Viv DeWalker, CIO from the HBAR Foundation for the first edition uh, of our State of the Hedera quarterly call. Um, so we'll cover today several topics around Hedera, starting with a brief background and history of the protocol before discussing um, the important ad advancements in 2023, highlights from the past, the fourth quarter, and from there, we'll close with what we can look forward to for this year. Um, let me remind you before we get started that the information contained in this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. So let's get started. Um, given that's our first quarterly call with you, let's kick the kid off and uh, with some background about Hedera. So what is Hedera? How does it differ from other layer ones? Yeah, great. I'll, I'll go ahead and take that. Um, so, hi, Sasha. Uh, thanks for having us. Thanks for having Vivian and myself. And thanks, uh, thanks to the Thai as well for this opportunity. And I'll also say hello to everybody out there who's uh, taking the time to listen um, to this webinar. So, to start with, um, at a basic level, Hedera is an open source proof of stake uh, network. Um, Hedera is powering the next generation of, of the web. Um, and some of the, the key differentiators for Hedera really break down into two different categories. Those are technology features and then the overall approach to network governance. Um, on, the, um, on the technology side, the network has been intentionally designed um, so that it meets the needs of both enterprise use cases as well as Web3 applications. That means Hedera is um, in a unique position to be able to deliver speed, scalability, and security, all of that with low and predictable costs. And some of these technical differences that we're going to highlight um, between Hedera and some of the other L1s that, that, you'll, that you'll see um, become critically important um, for many of the different use cases that we're looking at. A few examples, you know, real-time finality is imperative for some of the financial use cases that we're looking at where you can't have the risk of a rollback. Um, extremely low and predictable fixed costs or you know, costs that are fixed in US dollar um, allows enterprise use cases um, to be built and to predict operating costs without the risk of wide variances. Um, and the ability for a network like Hedera to scale to handle an extremely high volume of transactions is critically important for some of the potential high volume use cases that uh, that we've got you know looking at the network the example of that would be you know the op.io platform from avery Dennison. on the government side um, our network is governed by uh, the hedera governing council this is a group of, of international highly diversified um, global organizations each of whom have a single vote uh, some of the examples of, of these companies are Google, Dell, IBM, Boeing, ServiceNow. That just names names a few. Um, we have more than thirty members at this point. Um, this um, this approach um, is 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 mature and it's trusted, and it isn't seen anywhere else in the industry. We haven't seen another L one that has a similar approach to governance, and we think it provides um, an unmatched level of trust and stability for the network. A um, couple other, you know, data points for the network. Um, open access for mainnet was back in September of 2019, so we're you know, a little over four years uh, into the journey. Um, and, and since that time, Hedera has been focusing on a decentralized approach to the growth and maintenance of the overall ecosystem. Um, this includes an ecosystem development organization like the HBAR Foundation, where Viv and I both work, along with other special purpose ecosystem development orgs that. that um, have have uh, formed as well and also swirls labs which is responsible for protocol level engineering and development developer support programs and overall marketing for the hair ecosystem so that's a pretty cursory overview of what um of what comprises hedera and i'm fortunate to have bid here in case you want to go any deeper on the tech side yeah, so maybe let's shift gears and talk a little bit about the consensus mechanism. So Hedera uses a Hashgraph consensus mechanism. Can you tell us um, what what does this mean? How does it work? And how is this a differentiator for the Hedera blockchain? Thanks, Sasha. So I like what David's words first. It's a pleasure to be here with our friends from the Thai. And thank you, everyone, who's also dialing in. Um, so first of all, Hedera is a DLT, not a blockchain, and there are some material differences that come with being a DLT versus a blockchain. 
So insofar as consensus is concerned, Hedera uses gossip about gossip with virtual voting to come to network-wide consensus. So what does that mean? You know, that's that's a, a lot of words there. So for any blockchain or DLT, you know, the purpose of consensus is to come to agreement on what the current state of the network is, you know, based on the transactions that are coming in and, you know, proposing modifications to the network. It could be transfers of crypto, of NFTs, of, you know, account balance queries, whatever it might be. So on the Hedera network, these transactions are submitted to a class of nodes that we call our consensus nodes, who then consult among themselves to decide the ordering of messages. And when we say, you know, consult among themselves, this is also around what state changes should or shouldn't happen, whether there are balance updates, who should receive what token, et cetera, you know, sticking with the similar example that I used. So the consulting between the consensus nodes that happens, that happens via a gossip protocol. Now, what that basically means is any node on the network, uh, David mentioned our governing council, they all run nodes. Uh, any node in the network will randomly pick any two other nodes and, and relay everything that they know as messages. What they also include is the time that they receive these messages. And basically what happens is if one node tells two, the two tell another two and so forth. So you have at a quadratic, uh, well, at an exponential rate really, that information is broadcast across the network. So once the whole network has all these messages and times, um, each individual message, the timestamps on these are ordered and the median is taken. And this gives you a relative ordering of all the individual messages relative to each other. So what you get for free using um, the Hashgraph consensus mechanism is completely fair ordering. Now, the relative ordering is tied together with cryptographic hashes within each message, and this forms a data structure called a directed acyclic graph or a DAG, and this is the hash graph. So in order to keep the hash graph up to date, the nodes in effect are indirectly gossiping about the hash graph itself, rather as well as the messages, if you will. So this is gossip about gossip. Now, you have a structure that holds messages, you have all the ordering, you have the timing and all this sort of thing. So now what do we do with this? So this is kept in memory on all the consensus nodes and this gives a complete history of transaction, which means there's no need for the nodes to start talking to each other about, you know, um, time stamping or sending any other additional synchronization messages or receipts across the network, which means in order to know the order of transactions, which is very important for financial services, use cases and the like, all a node needs to do is look at its own hash graph data structure in memory. So it doesn't need to ask for votes. And this is what we call virtual voting piece. Now, all that was, you know, a condensed version of how, you know, the protocol works, but more to the point, you know, why should you, you know, why should you care is probably the bigger question. So, Immediately, virtual voting means that Hedera is not a chatty protocol and gossip about gossip adds very little network overhead. So this means automatically you have the potential and the realization of a high throughput network. It's also leaderless in that all the nodes participate in consensus rather than having specific nodes that uh, being elected, if you will, as you see in leader based systems. So you get complete fairness. Now, the other good thing about the random nature of gossip means that you have fair access for messages to propagate throughout the network because you can't have any sort of uh, concentration attacks and the like where only certain messages are getting through and so forth. Um, I already briefly touched on the way timestamping is done and the relative ordering. So this way you get completely fair queuing of your messages and your transactions basically. So this eliminates some kind of front running attacks, civil attacks. So from a security perspective, it's a very, very safe and secure protocol and it's been proven as such. Now, again, David mentioned financial services use cases, the fair ordering of transactions is absolutely critical, especially if you're looking at, you know, balance operations like credits and debits and so forth, which could succeed or fail based on availability of balances, which depend on fair ordering of transactions. Now, extending that on that a little bit, when we talk about reaching consensus, if you think of blockchains, you end up with a block being written and so forth. But this is probabilistic finality, because it's only as more and more blocks are written, there's less and less likelihood that a given block that contains your transaction is going to be pruned and therefore rolled back. 
with Hedera Hashgraph, finality is absolute. So once the network agrees something happened, there's no going back. So again, from a financial services perspective, finality is a key piece. So to summarize, what do you get? You get completely fair access, timestamping and ordering, and you get fast and absolute finality. And then if you think of some of the services that are built on top of Hedera, we have a consensus service. So this allows you know any distributed app out there to directly access the speed, finality, and fair ordering benefits of the Hedera hash graph. And this is great for use cases that need, you know, um, authenticity and provenance, you know, fair ordering of transactions, guaranteed delivery, queuing, that kind of thing. We also have a native token service, and this allows for the entire management of a token lifecycle. So we're talking creates, mints, burns, et cetera, without the need to resort to a smart contract. So this is great for collectibles, loyalty, you know, let's say shares, dividends, tokenization style use cases. And then extending that further, if you want the additional autonomous logic and programmability, you know, things like triggered workflows, custom governance, then our EVM layer allows for deploying Solidity smart contracts to give you that as well. So that's kind of hash graph consensus in a nutshell and what we've built on top of it. Very interesting. And uh, so on, on the governance side, Guiding Hedera is the governing council that comprises very prominent organizations like Google, Nomura, and Boeing, just to cite a few. Um, I'm curious about the council's specific decision-making processes uh, and responsibilities within the network governance structure. Um, could you elaborate on how this approach to governance compares with uh, other projects and differentiates Hedera from other blockchain networks? Yeah, certainly. Um, so to, to start with, and, and Viv touched on, on one piece of this, um, the, the core responsibilities um, of the governing council members are, are actually, um, it's a pretty short list. They agree to operate one of the nodes for the network, and they agree to sign transactions on the network that implement the decisions of the governing council. Um, beyond that, the governing council, um, they, to, to stay um, active and engaged um, in the overall governance and, and, and happenings of the network itself, the governing council meets on a monthly basis. Um, twice a year, those meetings um, uh, turn into fairly rigorous face-to-face -face affairs um, that cover uh, several days. But for many people, you know, a full week because it involves travel, um, a lot of travel, so people make the most out of that. And you'll have the um, ecosystem development organizations like like the HBAR Foundation, like Swirls Labs, also participating in, in those face-to-face um, -face, um, meetings. Uh, beyond the, the regular governing council level meetings, um, the governing council functions through a series of committees um, that uh, are co-chaired by representatives from each of the member organizations. And the rest of the committee will um, be comprised of, of representatives for, from the governing council member organizations. And then you have additional participation um, in those committees from Hedera staff, and other invited guests and experts like HR Foundation and and uh, and, and other um, uh, identified people. Um, these committees um, focus um, on all aspects um, of the network, including membership, so recruiting um, and um, and so-called care and feeding of, of the members of the, the governing council. Um, corporate utilization and adoption, which focuses on you know, some of the large corporate and enter enterprise use cases and making sure that the um, technology continues to be suitable for those. Technical steering and, and product, which is, is you know, core protocol level um, features and responding to HIPs um, and things like that. Treasury management, coin economics, um, legal and regulatory compliance matters and marketing to name just a couple of those. Um, and, and as I mentioned um, previously, this type of, of governance model, this, this um, in, engaging and relying on the trusted reputations of these global organizations isn't seen anywhere else in, in the blockchain industry. Um, and, and we think that a model of governance like this uh, provides uh, better fairness, um, better stability um, for the, the organization and ecosystem itself. And, and really offers a, a decentralized decision-making for the Hedera ecosystem. And yet, despite the bear market in 2023, 
Um, the the HBAR the HBAR Foundation reported impressive year-over-year -year growth in transaction volumes, accounts growth, uh, and network revenue as well. So 30 billion transactions and revenue grew nearly a thousand percent. What do you attribute this to? What what strategies um, does Hedera plan to continue this positive growth trajectory in the future? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for bringing it up. I mean, overall, we were uh, pretty pleased with how 2023 went. Um, it was a pretty tough macroeconomic climate, um, for sure. Um, it's, you know, first, um, important to note, I think that a lot of the performance and the results that we saw in 2023 um, is the result of seeds that were planted um, over the last several years. Um, and while it's true that we're um, a grant giving organization, our role really just starts with the grant rather than ending at the grant. Um, so our team um, last year spent a lot of time working directly with the various projects in the ecosystem that we had been supporting and helped them navigate a pretty tricky period. And we saw you know, a number of, of, of pretty meaningful um, projects hit mainnet um, that, that contributed to the results that you saw. Um, regarding the, the overall, there's kind of the dramatic increase that you mentioned in transaction volume, 30 billion plus transactions, it's pretty easy um, for people to just point to this, the, uh, the, the release um, by Avery Dennison of their Optima.io platform. And when you see that type of a dramatic jump in overall network utilization, you're obviously going to see you know, a commensurate, commensurate increase in, in the, the associated revenue as well. But um, there's more to the story. I mean, there's a number of really interesting highlights from 2023 that I think get overshadowed by those, those large um, headlines. Um, some of the examples are um, on HTS, or our token service revenue. We saw 124% um, increase year over year in, um, in revenue from the HTS uh, service. And this is despite a, a fairly dramatic decline um, in NFTs, which I think every ecosystem um, experienced. Uh, but that was countered uh, by pretty substantial growth that we saw in our fungible, fungible token um, projects that more than offset that decline that we saw in NFTs. Um, we also saw um, pretty, pretty solid growth uh, from both our crypto transactions, which grew um, over 150% year over year, as well as in the adoption of the smart contract service, uh, which was up nearly 50% um, year over year. Um, and, and one of the things we were really excited about because you know we just you need users to be able to grow the network and to and to see that type of, of exponential growth we had really incredible growth in our new accounts this is across all service categories we were up nearly 200 percent year over year adding um, over 2.7 million accounts to close the year with over 4, 4 million um, total user accounts we saw uh, really good contributions to the to the user um, growth coming from projects like Karate Combat, um, as well as Zenny, which is a travel platform. Um, and the stats are um, that, I, that I shared to sort of like break down um, one level are, are really important because the mix of the different network services that we have matters a lot to our overall network revenues. Um, the you know, we talked about the, the consensus service and, and, you know, a number of our really large projects use the consensus service and HCS comprised uh, around 99.7% of total transaction volume on the network. Um, but even though it represented that much volume, it only represented um, just over 86% of network revenue. That means the remaining 0.03% of transaction volume contributed almost 14% of, of the network revenue. So as we look um, in 2024 and beyond to build on the performance that we had in, in 2023, we want to maintain our focus on driving a really healthy mix across the, the different network services that we offer. Um, and as a result, um, we, we want to focus on projects and use cases that are going to drive that usage and, and sustain that, that sort of mix. Um, we're also going to continue to focus um, maniacally on grant quality, and continuing to nurture the grants that we've made so that we can bring more and more quality products into the ecosystem. Yeah, so as as, as you, you touched a little bit on this, right, but throughout 2023, um, a number of institutions launched applications on Hedera, right? And by uh, 
like drop a micropayment solutions or Xeni that you brought up, a travel ecosystem. Um, also Aberdeen, a major asset manager in the UK, um, chose to tokenize the money market fund uh, on Hedera. So tell us a little bit more about what Aberdeen is trying to accomplish, why they chose Hedera and, and what has been the reception thus far. Sure. Sure. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm hogging Viv, but, but uh, you'll, you'll get your chance um, soon. Um, so Aberdeen was, was a, a really exciting addition to the ecosystem. And, and really, they chose um, to join the Hedera ecosystem for a number of the, the reasons or the network attributes that we've already um, mentioned um, earlier. Um, principally, predictable fees, security of the network, scalability for enterprise and financial use cases, um, and importantly, an opportunity to participate in the governance of the network. Um, so they, you know, shortly after joining, um, they uh, launched their first use case, which was tokenization of their money market fund. Um, now, you know, money market funds, I'm not sure if everybody's aware of how they traditionally work, but traditional money market funds um, come with some administrative burdens around same day redemptions and reinvestment of associated returns on same day redemptions. But when fund ownership gets tokenized on the blockchain, investors are able to receive those same day payments. And then you have um, automatic reinvestment of the associated income, which comes in the form of an airdrop token um, directly into the investor's account. So from the user's perspective, they see a benefit of real time access to their money, as well as fewer administrative demands and hurdles. Uh, this product um, was was launched um, on Archax, which is a regulated digital assets exchange in Europe. Um, and so far, the response from the market um, was was better than expected. Um, in particular, from uh, some of the tr traditional corporates, um, things like payment companies. Um, so, I think um, the the takeaway from that is that tokenization of money market funds. Um, it's just the first step for Aberdeen and what they're um, planning to do. I think we expect to see more products coming to market from them that leverage tokenization of financial products. And, and you know, we plan to take the, the positive experience um, from that um, and, and take it into the market and look for other opportunities to, to replicate it. Sounds sounds great. And uh, you know, speaking of tokenizing uh, financial products, you know, there's a big topic, which are stable coins. So at Token 2049 in Singapore last September, you announced Stablecoin Studio, right? An, an open source stablecoin insurance and management toolkit. Um, what is Stablecoin Studio? What What is its significance and who is using it? Sure, I'll take this one. Um, so I guess before we get into the studio, if you think about stable coins in and of themselves, like what are they trying to achieve? So they're trying to combine, you know, the programmability and the ease of transfer that is, you know, seems to be the, what cryptocurrencies are really, really good at with the stability of fiat currencies. But this is not an easy thing to do in practice. And, you know, you have challenges around the issuance, the access control, uh, permissions management, KYC and AML, especially, you know, where regulated entities are participating, audit requirements, et cetera. These are all key challenges. So the Stablecoin Studio is an open source toolkit that was built on top of the Hedera services that I mentioned earlier, and in particular, the smart contract service and our token service that facilitates compliance by design. So it was created by Hedera, Swirls Labs, the HBA Foundation, and one of our SI partners, IO Builders, to address these ch challenges in a comprehensive way, but also give sort of the streamlined tooling to make operating, like issuing and operating stable coins simple. So it's fully open source. It's a collection of Apache two licensed components. And out of the box, you get an SDK and a management, you know, command line interface. So this allows you to programmatically define, build, and manage the lifecycle of stable coins without, you know, ever needing um, DLT or smart contract expertise per se, because they also come bundled with some fully audited smart contracts. So we use a hybrid architecture between uh, our token service and our uh, smart contract service. So using native token service, you get ERC20 compliant tokens, which have all the properties that we covered earlier, like low fixed fees, fast and absolute finality. And you also get all the programmable properties of our HCS service, sorry, HTS service. So this includes, you know, flags for 
native KYC. And this again is for the compliance piece. We also have integrations with Elliptic and Merkle Science Services to facilitate this as well. If you need additional programmability, we have pre-built smart contracts available as part of the studio. Um, so you can use the smart contract service to define custom issuance schedules, vesting, governance, and these smart contracts, as I mentioned earlier, um, have been fully audited by CERTIC. We also have APIs and integrations sort of, you know, uh, front and center, so to speak, because we have hooks leading into custody providers like Fireblocks, Zodia, and BitGo, and this will help, you know, automate asset custody and security. And these are like some of the heaviest hitters in the in the industry. It also comes with a demo front end application to, you know, help people reason about what can be built and, you know, and also use some of the components. It also has proof of reserve for treasury management. And there's also an interactive sandbox that you can connect your hashback or MetaMask wallet to and issue stable coins. And, you know, I was playing with it and I was able to issue my own stable coin in literally five steps. So why is this significant? You know, it, so it allows for real time settlement and FX rate integration across mainstream fiat currencies. And, and this can be done at volume when you take into account the speed of the Terra network. Being programmable, it also means that the issuances can keep pace and also evolve as regulatory and compli compliance requirements change. Um, it's the programmability is on the EVM layer. So it means EVM-based stable coins can be integrated uh, into trading in future, even if they're not necessarily issued through the stablecoin studio. Now, I also mentioned under the hood, it uses uh, HTS. So you, you have the cheap, fast, and final transactions. And so far, um, we have Cathay Bank, Jewel Bank, Standard Bank, and Shinan Bank using our stablecoin studio. Uh, from the solutions provider's perspective, we have SCB TechX. And from a settlement layer technology perspective, we have Rivia Finance, who are actively using our stablecoin studio. Very good. So let's dig now a little bit into Hedera's DeFi ecosystem. All right. So Saucer Swap uh, Dex decentralized exchange on Hedera achieved record TVL in 2023. Um, how do you think about DeFi on Hedera uh, going forward? What are your plans? And can you share? how you're planning to grow this vertical in 2024. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I appreciate you um, pointing out the, uh, the, the performance by, by Saucer Swap. I'm, not only did they um, hit a record TVL, um, but when you measure it in, in HBAR, they also saw um, 2x growth in, in TVL. So overall, they're doing really well. We're excited um, to, to see them continue to grow and have traction. I think um, generally when we think about DeFi on Hedera, we're, we're happy about the progress that we've made. Um, I, I think we're pretty optimistic about seeing continued growth um, this year. And, and, and as we move forward, we've got a lot of work um, or a lot of opportunities to, to add um, to the ecosystem. We think Hedera is a, a overall a good place um, for DeFi, a good ecosystem to support DeFi use cases. Um, some of the network features that, that we've discussed um, you have a real positive effect um, for DeFi projects. Specifically, you see um, speed and, and low cost um, having a real benefit um, to the overall user experience. You know, trades um, happen faster. Fees are really low with no surprises. Um, you know, Viv mentioned uh, not having to worry about front running because of the design of the network. So overall, it's a, it's a really good user experience. Um, we just need to see, see more growth. Um, in terms of, of specific um, plans for 2024, I don't think we have much that, that we can share specifically today about um, how, we, how we're going to look to grow in, uh, in 2024. I know we're going to continue to, to focus on fundamentals. Um, we'll continue to you know, focus on nurturing and supporting the existing projects um, and helping them reach their goals of, of attracting um, more users. Um, and we also recognize that we've got gaps to fill um, on both the lending side and, and, and borrowing side as well. So we definitely still have work to do. Um, there's definitely still opportunities in front of us. Great to hear. And uh, so changing topics slightly, um, in December at the COP28, uh, you know, the 2023 UN Climate Change Conference, the HBIO Foundation announced a platform for measuring, reporting, and verifying 
carbon markets. Can you give us a little bit more background on this initiative? Um, why is it important for Hedera and, and who do you see as the users for this platform? Sure, yeah. The, the Hedera Guardian is a, a flagship um, project um, for the Hedera ecosystem. It's sponsored by uh, the team and our Sustainable Impact Fund here at the HBAR Foundation. Um, fundamentally, the Guardian makes it easier for governments and nonprofits and companies to come together and enable um, measurement and reporting and verification for climate accounting. Um, it's a, uh, at its core, it's a decentralized workflow engine um, that, that structures rules and data on Hedera and allows the organizations to define uh, these complex scientific methodologies and then they can fully digitize those um, so that it can be proven and all of the data can then be linked um, to, a, to, a, uh, to a tokenized um, unit of value, um, something like a metric ton of carbon, um, where you can then see all of the associated information um, to, to that unit on chain. Um, users of the Guardian, um, that's generally any organization across um, the ESG, ESG value chain that wants to credibly track their emissions and then leverage these assets in ESG reporting, or they want um, the carbon credits that they're purchasing to come with a full audit trail so that they can trust that the information is real. And ultimately they can you know, take these asset, assets and they can display them themselves or they can retire them and, and claim you know, that they've reached net zero on, on Hedera. Um, so a, a high profile example of a, of a user of the Guardian in our ecosystem is um, Avery Dennison with the Atma.io platform. Um, but, but really um, anybody that has um, sustainability initiatives um, becomes a potential user of, of the Guardian. So we see a lot of growth potential in this market and, and it's a really big uh, market opportunity for us. And we think we've got technical features um, and uh, that, that enable us to do things that other ecosystems can't do. Yeah, and, and in, uh, in speaking of the ecosystem, right, in 2023, um, the HBAR Foundation committed $16 million across 68 grants. Um, that marks a strategic focus on nurturing existing brands, supporting specific sectors like infrastructure, media, also entertainment, right? Um, could you share insights into how the foundation's grant program is shaping the development that's taking place on the Hedera ecosystem? Um, how, I mean, how do you select the recipients and what impact these grants have, particularly in areas where funding was most concentrated? Sure. Um... So I guess I'll start with, you know, our selection process. And, you know, this is something that we've been focusing on literally from day one um, and is still very much something that gets our undivided attention and we continue to evolve it. So there are four key stages um, of our grant process. So first of all, there's application. Uh, so this is done through the foundation website and, you know, applicants submit their uh, application, and then this goes into queue for review by our BD team. Now, it then, you know, is either qualified or, or not, and the qualified ones then go further along into our due diligence phase. So this is where we spend most of our time actually working with the grantees. So, you know, the BD folks work with the grantees to tease out, you know, what's the value of the grant based on, you know, different metrics. Is it utility that it'll bring to the network? Is it value? that it'll create, you know, how it lines up with our strategic outcomes, growth areas, uh, and a host of other criteria that are both fund and uh, overall foundation specific. And at the end of this, there's a proposal for what the grant is going to look like. The proposal then gets a technical review of where we look at things like feasibility, cost evaluations, architecture and service use, you know, milestone definitions, success criteria, and so forth. And we work very closely with the grantee to refine this over and over until all parties are satisfied. Then it goes over to finance review. At this point, you know, things like payment amounts, the timing, uh, payment instruments that'll be used are finalized. And all the while, you know, in these countless meetings that are happening with different members of THF, you know, we're always on the lookout for any potential red flags or anything like that. Um, after that, it goes through two rounds of committee approvals. 
the first one is uh, the HBAR committee, which is more so within foundation. And you know, this is a very critical review. We ask clarifying questions. Uh, if there are any requests for revisions, this is where it happens and everything is sort of hammered out. Then it goes for final approval to the foundation committee and then it's over to our legal team. So here, a legal uh, agreement is drafted and then you know, we have third party providers who conduct KYC, KYB on the grantee. And if everything checks out, then the digital contract is sent to the grantee. Now, you know, David mentioned, you know, our work doesn't end with the grant, it pretty much starts with the grant. So at this point, we provide a lot of support to our grantees. So everything from technical, we help them, you know, work through any of the challenges that they're having during the build stages, as they're getting closer to going to market, you know, we pair up with our resources from marketing around press releases, joint announcements, that kind of thing. And of course, there's the financial side of the support that we provide. Um, so I guess the impact of, you know, the rigorous process that we've put in place means that, you know, by the time someone comes at the other end and the legal agreements and all that are signed, we've already spent a lot of time and sort of sown the seeds to a successful grant, which means overall our efforts and, you know, level of failure, if you will, from what goes to production is significantly reduced and mitigated. And it also means that we can be very targeted and strategic in how, how and where we deploy our capital and also understand ahead of time very clearly, you know, what the impact is going to be and over what time period and to what scale. And so last year you, you, you launched the project insight, right? So what is project insight and what, what purpose does it serve for Hedera and the ecosystem? Sure. So I think one of the biggest um, things that we focused on early on was go as broad as we can, as deep as we can, as fast as we can. And then, you know, very quickly we came to start asking, you know, questions internally, like, you know, how are we and our grants performing? So Project Insight was launched last year, and it's a real-time analytics platform that combines network data, everything that happened on the network, with internal grantee data to give us a view of the impact, of both now and the future impact that our grants will have on the network. So at a high level, it gives a view of treasury, overall health, and performance of the fund, but it also allows us to drill down into you know, even individual grant and milestone level reporting to understand you know, upside and impact and also, you know, help us make decisions on, you know, where we continue funding, where we make adjustments and so forth. It's still very much in the early stages. And, you know, today we can um, pretty conclusively understand, you know, how are we and our grants performing? And, you know, some of the numbers that David was able to mention earlier in terms of year on year growth, in terms of the um, distribution of revenue across different services and so forth, all this comes out of Project Insight. Now, where you know this was this isn't a one and done. You know we're pretty far from where we want to be with the product. So you know future iterations will also focus on forecasting. You know differentiating, you know grantee activity versus organic growth activity on the network, uh, and getting a more refined and a richer view of the Hedera ecosystem as a whole. Um, but then again, you know looking at the way Web three as a whole is going, it's not just about us on our little island. You know we need to be able to understand you know, what some of the other ecosystems are doing as well. And, you know, we have our partners like the Thai, uh, who we work with quite closely to get these insights, but equally, how do we take all of this and get a unified view of how we're doing, how our network is doing and what our focus area should be for future growth and profitability across the network and also our grantees and builders and community. And based on, on all those insights that you've gathered, so what what, what are the grants uh, program uh, that are going to be available in 2024? Um, and what, what are the particular areas of focus that you intend to have? And where do you want to attract development in the space? Sure. Yeah, well, well one of the things, just building on what um, Viv mentioned, that one of the benefits from a, a fully functional project insight is that it will help us in the future make decisions about the grant programs and the grant structures um, that that have proved to be most successful in terms of, of taking 
a, a dollar um, and turning it into you know network utilization um, that's a multiple of that. And so, so we're going to continue to to um, you know feed that information um, back, you know, all the information we have into uh, Project Insights, so we can get those types of um, decision making um, benefits. Um, in terms of 2024, we are going to continue to focus on infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure um, to you know, support the overall growth of our ecosystem. Um, we also are going to be rolling out um, a number of programs that are going to be very developer centric. Um, we uh, want to be the most friendly um, uh, uh, ecosystem for developers um, in the industry. Um, in addition to that, you know, we obviously um, still believe in the in the work being done and the underlying underlying theses um, of our you know four original funds. So we're going to continue to support development in those areas and also continue to nurture the grants that have already been made um, by those teams to to bring those um, products to mainnet. Um, and in terms of some other specific areas where where we're exploring and and being er very active in, in some of the conversations that we're having. And we think the media and entertainment space is really interesting, um, specifically um, projects that are, are leveraging well-known IP um, to engage um, consumers. Um, and we're, um, you know, continue, as I mentioned before, we um, continue to be engaged in a lot of conversations with, you know, financial institutions and in capital markets broadly, um, which we think is a really big opportunity. And, you know, we, we see that opportunity, as I mentioned before, to be able to, you know, leverage some of the, the good work that was done by Aberdeen um, to show kind of, you know, what's possible in that space. Um, and then there's obviously a, a growing amount of interest um, in, in AI and, and specifically the intersection of AI and blockchain. Um, you see this growing concentration of power in, in, in Gen AI and the companies, you know, leading in that space. And, and this creates you know, a bit of a risk. Um, so we see, um, as others do, an opportunity for the decentralized data model from blockchain to mitigate some of those risks. I know this was a, a big topic, um, uh, topic of conversation recently um, in Davos, um, where you saw a number of announcements of products um, exploring this space, including a, an announcement by Equity Lab um, of a, an AI integrity platform um, that that uh, is integrating with, with Hedera. So those are some of the areas where, where we're focusing and and and, um, and and hope to um, hope to have some success um, this year. And what hopefully you know together with those, those successes uh, for for this year, what are the biggest challenges that you foresee in scaling the Hedera network and increasing its adoption not only among mainstream users but also institutions? Um, how does the foundation plan to address these challenges in 2024? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, look, we're, we're um, as critical uh, of ourselves as anybody else. And, and while I think this is um, a bit of a, a macro problem for, for the entire industry, um, we need to be constantly focusing on, on the overall user experience. Um, and that's not just the user experience for, for retail users, but it also extends to the experience that developers have and enterprises and other institutions when they're um, interacting inside the Hedera ecosystem. Um, we need to be easy to use. We need to be easy to start using. We need to be easy for you to continue to use. Um, and we think this is how ultimately you start to kind of win hearts and minds. Um, so for the retail side, you know, we think a lot about um, you know, how we can get better with, with the fiat to crypto on ramp, um, on ramps and off ramps. Um, we know we still have um, work to do there to enable, uh, you know, much simpler user experience. Um, and this isn't just, you know, in the U S with USD, but it's also outside the U S, um, with some of the various local currencies. Um, we, we think about wallet infrastructure and how we can you know, bring Hedera closer to the experiences that people are already familiar with. An example here would be the, the MetaMask Hedera wallets now. Um, for the projects that we're supporting, this also means that we're focusing very heavily, a lot of our resources on, on and decision-making around product quality. Um, we want to back teams who are highly focused um, on user experience and product iteration, iteration once they've been able to determine or, or, or land on you know, product market fit. 
I think some good examples of, of that um, where we've seen success is Hashpack and Blade, um, uh, which are you know, two of the wallets in the ecosystem. One's a B2C wallet, the other's a B2B2C offering. Um, and it's also why we you know, focus on, on uh, infrastructure like Wallet Connect. Um, on the enterprise side, we've actually been making quite a bit of progress with um, you know, many use cases that are under, under development um, from the different members of the governing council. So I think we'll continue to look to, to deploy you know, a lot of resources there. Um, and we're also um, broadly across you know, the enterprise space, we're looking to, to move the dev tools and infrastructure that those institutions and the enterprises are already familiar with and move them onto Hedera so we can enable a better, more seamless um, development experience. And can you discuss the foundation strategy for selecting and collaborating with partners? I mean, what you know, what what criteria do you use to ensure that you know, partnership aligns with Hedera's mission? Uh, what are the strategic goals? What are your core areas of focus? Is it tokenization, DeFi, et cetera, et cetera? Sure. Um, so I guess you know, rising tide floats all boats, right? And the success of Hedera will also be driven by the broader success of Web3. So to give you an example, you know, we partnered with Algorand Foundation to launch the DREC Alliance. And this is a decentralized recovery system for digital assets. And this helps, you know, all of Web3, not just us. And, you know, it aims to streamline the process of securing, you know, and recovering digital assets. And in a way, this also paves the path for other elements like standards around secret management and common practices and familiarity and more than anything transferability of uh, familiarity so in a way when we're picking partners it's not just about what's going to benefit us immediately but also what benefits the ecosystem as a whole then in a similar vein you know if we're assessing the needs of our ecosystem you know both the incumbents and the entrance it's are we partnering with someone who's best able to fill some of the gaps. So are we finding the right SI partners, the right, you know, tokenomics and advisory partners? Um, building a decentralized app is one thing. Taking to production has other sets of challenges. Do we have the right operations partners and so forth? So in terms of, you know, are we picking a specific area like tokenization or DeFi or so forth? The short answer is in a way, all of the above. It's more about making sure that we have the right collection and combination of tools that are composable and easy to use that facilitate all classes of use case, whether it's retail or enterprise, whether it's tokenization or DeFi or collectibles or loyalty, whatever the case might be. And also in, in a recent Twitter space, right, expanded growth and liquidity for the HBAR economy were really highlighted as key focuses for 2024. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the specific strategies um, that Hedera plans to implement to achieve these goals? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we recognize um, that, that there's room to grow here. And, and so we are um, evaluating, developing some strategies um, around ways that we can increase overall liquidity in our ecosystem. Um, one of the top priorities is, is growing the amount of USDC on, on Hedera. That's a, a key priority for us um, in, in 2024. And we expect um, that, that we can see more growth around the USDC um, asset on Hedera, not just as a standalone asset, but also potentially we'll see it as a transfer or a support asset you know, for other stable coins and on-chain finance generally. Um, some of the other things that we're focusing on in, in 24, um, we're going to look to expand the number of bridges in the ecosystem, but make it easier for um, assets to move across the ecosystems. Um, we continue to do work with the uh, other uh, participants in the you know, Hedera ecosystem development to enhance EVM compatibility. Um, and we're also um, looking at some new incentive models and strategies that could also help to stimulate growth. Um, and finally, you know, we're aware of, of a, a growing um, demand for ETPs for the HR asset um, from the institutional community. And so we're going to look at ways that we might be able to support growth there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, speaking of growth, would be great to also hear from you on, on the funds that the HR um, Foundation has uh, deployed and how you see these uh, 
contributing to your 2024 strategy? So maybe let's start with the sustainable impact fund, right? It has the ambitious goal of uh, bringing uh, the balance sheet of the planet to the public ledger. Could you elaborate on the foundation's uh, expanded focus on sustainability markets for 2024? Um, how do partnerships like with Dovu uh, align with your broader goals in regenerative finance? Um, you know, what's what specific outcomes and impact are you trying to uh, aim to achieve in this area in 2024? And how do you measure success in this relatively new field? Yeah, sure. Um, first, I, I, I'd like to gently challenge the notion that we have an expanded focus on sustainability for 2024. Um, this is one of the unique characteristics, I think, um, of the Hedera e ecosystem, and it, it always has been. Hedera has been investing um, in solutions um, for many years that solve some of the really difficult um, problems, climate-related problems, um, in particular those around measurement and verification and reporting of carbon emissions and, and offsets and other related areas. And when we launched the foundation back in uh, 2021 and we established um, the Sustainable Impact Fund, we became the first public network um, to have a dedicated major grant fund in climate, um, one that supported both infrastructure and applications um, driving critical outcomes in the market. Um, so we've had sustainability as a core focus of our work um, at the foundation since the beginning, and, and this will continue um, as we head into 2024. So I just wanted to just wanted to, to level set that it's, it's an important area for us. Um, in, in 2024, I think you know, we want to build on some of the uh, successes that we saw in 2023. Um, you're working with folks like Avery Dennison um, and, and the Optima.io platform. Um, I think we also see the SIF team, you know, expanding um, to, to work with, you know, some of the registries as well as partnering, you know, with validation and verification partners in the carbon markets. And I think we'll also start to focus more on, on emissions tracking, ESG reporting, and some biodiversity opportunities that we've been tracking as well. So um, measuring success here, success for us, you know, shows up in, in the overall growth in the number of applications that are deployed using the Guardian infrastructure. Um, so that's the initial indicator. This will lead then to uh, tokenized assets being deployed on Hedera in the form of you know, carbon credits and emissions which in turn also drives you know, additional um, network traffic and transactions and overall utilization of the Hedera network. Mm -hmm. and, and then you have the consumer engagement fund, right? And it's more geared towards enabling high quality Web3 experiences, uh, redefining interactions between brands and consumers in the digital space, right? So how is the concept of ecosystem as a service evolving? Um, evolving the way that brands engage with their customers through the Hedera network. Um, could you provide examples of how this service is fostering a new owner economy? I mean, what does it mean for, for the future of consumer brand relationships? Yeah, I'm happy, happy to dig in on this one. This is interesting because the, you know, you see a lot of interest from the brands um, in this space and you see a lot of, of, of shoulder shrugging, not really knowing exactly what to do or how to do it to, to address these opportunities that they see with their, um, you know, customers, you know, fans, you know, it depends on, on, on the, the type of entity involved, but, but we see is you know this opportunity to fundamentally change the way that that you know a customer or a fan of a particular brand engages with with that with that um, brand or the, or the products that they sell, and and the opportunity to get away from you know so-called surveillance capitalism um, that has been the the prevailing model to date, and so the ecosystem as a service um, strategy isn't isn't um, isn't directly addressing this, but it, it is a uh, sort of uh, plug and play product suite of interoperable dApps that, that allows the brands to get started um, addressing the opportunity that they see um, to, you know, to, to capture um, and create, you know, greater um, customer engagement and loyalty. And this is around uh, things like ticketing, rewards and incentives, entertainment, you know, gamification, collectibles, um, all of those we think are able, uh, capable anyways, of, of being reimagined um, on Hedera. 
And so providing these modular components that allow a, a brand to get started really quickly um, is, is what we see, where we see the, the true benefit of the ecosystem as a service strategy. And and then on the on the other part, there's the crypto economy and the fintech and payment funds. Um, these are focused more on mod modernizing economic behavior and improving value exchange through on-chain finance. How are these funds working to integrate traditional financial institutions into the on-chain ecosystem? Can you discuss the specific challenges and opportunities that this bring? Uh, in traditional finance uh, finance business models and infrastructure onto the blockchain, um, particularly in terms of privacy, compliance, uh, and also for tokenization? Sure. So I think um, in a way, despite the fact that, you know, DLT and blockchain have been evolving quite rapidly over, over a decade now, I think there are still elements, especially when it comes to uh, enterprise that are still you know, somewhat in their infancy. So I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of this is around how do we lower the barriers to entry and make participation in the Hedera ecosystem as simple as possible and as easy as possible. So some of our focus areas are very much around, you know, wallets. We continue to develop our wallets, you know, including non-English speaking targeted ones. Um, our SDK languages, we've, we also have we have Java, JavaScript, and Go traditionally, but we also have a whole lot of others. And there's a C++ one that's very much uh, coming on board soon to simplify the transition from, I guess, enterprise-focused capital markets use cases who are building on C++. And this, again, was based on demand. On the custody side, you know, we have Fireblocks, BitGo. Uh, we're always looking at exchange support for Dara. Um, in particular, the transfers in and out uh, of HBAR and tokens from the tooling perspective, you know, we have very close partnerships with the likes of Open Zeppelin, and you know, uh, we also support Ethers, which is some of the traditional EVM tooling. From the compliance part, we have Elliptic, Merkle Science, and you know, in terms of bringing financial service infrastructures uh, and platforms on chain, you know, we're working with FIS, Oasis Pro. Uh, David mentioned we have a very, very strong focus on bridging. And ultimately, you know, a, another piece that's generally ignored is the developer experience as well. So low and no-code pl platform. So we have um, JoeGit as one of our uh, grantees. And the challenge still remains that, you know, these are highly regulated entities. And sometimes there's even demarcation between the same entity. And navigating these challenges requires a lot of thought and making sure that, you know, all the relevant parties like, you know, auditors, uh, the regulator, et cetera, I engaged very early on and brought along on the journey. Um, interoperability is key. You know, we've seen this both from the perspective of on-chain to, to off-chain elements, but also across network ecosystems. Um, so uh, the likes of Layer Zero, uh, Axelar, and so forth. So from an opportunities perspective, I think reach is a big one. You know, it opens up traditional systems to new classes of users through new channels and these being the web three channels there's also implicitly a stack modernization so there's a big opportunity to solve you know reconciliation issues uh, between counterparties uh easily form and execute consortia use cases uh it's meeting the demand for instant cross-border both from the fx and settlement perspective and stable coins of course and built on the stable coin studio of course and looking beyond the immediate goals for 2024, um, what is the foundation's long-term vision for Hedera, especially in terms of um, sustaining the growth, uh, innovation in the rapidly evolving blockchain space uh, in, in the cryptocurrency uh, landscape? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, I think... You know, we, we as a leadership team at the HBAR Foundation, you know, we believe that the, the world will ultimately be tokenized. And obviously, we'd like to see that happen on Hedera. So our efforts at the foundation are going to be directed at enabling, you know, this transformation to take place across all industries, old and new. And to be able to do that, 
we need to have the best user experience. We need to be the ecosystem of choice for developers. And we need to continue to identify and support, you know, real use cases, solving real problems on chain. So that's where our focus is going to be. Awesome. Well, thank thank you so much for for sharing all those uh, all those insights. We've covered a lot, I think. Um, so now to close, what can you you know each can each of you tell us personally what are you most excited about in twenty twenty four? And maybe we can start with you, um, David, if, if you're up for it. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I think I, I've got a couple things I'm excited about. I'm excited about the prospect of the end of winter um, <laughs> and and being able to work with the team and, and with partners and, and, and projects, you know, in the space in an overall better environment when people just, just not, not as much doom and gloom. I think um, that would be pr pretty exciting. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to the, the areas where we're focused um, and, and some of the specific conversations that we're involved in that I think could provide serious momentum um, to the plans that we have to, to grow the overall ecosystem. Um, and I'm really excited to see the projects that, that we've already, um, uh, that have already launched in, in our ecosystem, watch them continue to grow and be successful and also see some of the projects that haven't yet launched um, get to mainnet and, and have that opportunity as well. And I won't play any favorites by by uh, calling out some of some of, of the particular projects that I'm focused on, but, but I've got a few that are, that are sort of pet projects for me. So I'd echo everything David said, but in a way, I think I'm most excited about the use cases we haven't seen yet. And in particular, because of the fact that we're coming out of you know what was a very, very long uh, flat spell in Web3 as a whole, but also now that you know the Bitcoin ETF ruling has come out definitively, despite that little hiccup on Twitter slash X the night before. But I think the general sentiment, and this is subjective and somewhat empirical, is that there's a lot more positivity around the art of the possible now that there has been a definitive ruling. So I'm very excited to see what use cases come out of the woodwork that have potentially already been under development and under wraps that are going to come uh, that are going to come out of hiding uh, from the user experience focus perspective there's so much that we're doing both to understand what our network is doing and what the other networks are doing and how web3 as a whole is growing and the focus and a big chunk of that is going to be driven by things like project insight and you know partnerships with the likes of our friends at the tie and i think all of this is going to be a very, very informative year, and I'm looking forward to learning. Yeah. Thank awesome. You. Thank you, Viv. I think we have a very exciting 2024 ahead. So thank you, Viv. Thank you, David. Uh, and this concludes our first edition of our State of Federa quarterly calls. Um, see you guys in a couple of months. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for having Great. us. Thanks, Sasha.